why people like this movie. Well, let's give another round of applause for director Brian Huston. <laughs> Thanks. You ever been played up by an organ before? Hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Don't see that very often, do you? Gotta be 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll bring you back out a few more times. What do you guys think? Should we bring him out a few more times? Yeah! yeah. Um, I mean, he has other films we can talk about. Uh, but tonight we're here for, you know, uh, society. So, uh, I have a lot of questions from the audience, so thank you all who um, uh, filled one out. Um, but I'm gonna get this thing going, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I mean, it's always kind of good to get a little of the backstory. You directed a film in 1978, and then started producing films in 1985. Um, but then, but you know, the next film you directed after 78 was this film in 1989, so there was, bit of time there that you were probably working and doing other things. So what was it that made you not only direct this film, but just, I mean, not only get behind this film, but direct it, you know, 10 years, 11 years after your first feature? Well, you couldn't really count the first one as a first feature. It was, I guess, what you'd more or less call a student film if you never went to school, which I never, <laughs> I never took a class or anything. Um, but in the 70s, I was, um, I ended up with a Bolex movie camera. I didn't know what to do with it, and um, I put an ad in the paper uh, the, for someone to help me, and uh, found somebody who knew how to make movies, and we tried making a short film. And it wasn't any good, so we decided to extend it into a long form film. <laughs> It was called Self-Portrait and Braids. <laughs> um, totally idiotic. And, um, but it definitely gave me the bug for being an ignorant kind of person. And that was when video was just beginning. That's why I got the Bolex camera. It was, it was, a, it was a TV news camera, which in the 80s and 60s, in the, in the 70s, um, TV news was shot on, on Bolex 16 millimeter, these 100, 100 foot reels, it's like four minute takes. And then video came in, and so they started dumping these things, so you could pick up a, a self-wind, it was a wind up at Bolex, and you could pick it up for no money. And um, I always liked movies, so I tried it. I'd done eight millimeter when I was a kid. And then that kind of got me into the movie thing. But I was living in North Carolina at that time and I couldn't get anybody to even show up if you tried to get them to show up. Nobody took it seriously. It wasn't like now where everybody kind of knows how to make a movie. And um, so then I went to LA and eventually because I wanted to kind of do it for real. I put a little ad in Variety Weekly that said, horror movie director wanted, <laughs> and I got hundreds of replies. This is before fax machines. Um, so, and then long story, through a long circuitous way, um, filled with, um, with sort of sages and villains, I ended up, coming to Chicago in, two, in 1983 over the Thanksgiving weekend to meet Stuart Gordon. And I, and I went to, because a friend in LA had said, you gotta meet this guy. And, they, and I went to the Organic Theater, I saw a couple of his plays, um, I saw how he dealt with the audience and then went had dinner with him, and we talked horror movies, and from there we made Reanimator. One year later, we were shooting in LA. We, I did want to shoot at the Organic Theater, but the Organic Theater committee didn't think it was a good deal to get 50% of Reanimator in return for shooting at the theater. <laughs> we had to do it in LA. But anyway, once you get into the, the, um, 
you know, once you're kind of making movies, then I started thinking that um, you kind of want to direct one because you kind of look and it seems like the director gets to make all these decisions and he gets to, um, you know, it's so important what he thinks. Make it red. He wants red. He wants red. <laughs> Everything is so heightened. And so I thought, well, I want to try that. And I had the rights to, um, to reanimate her because I paid for it. And so I had some friends that were starting up some cheap movies. And, they, um, and I liked that. And um, I said, well, listen, let me, I'll make the reanimator sequel with you but I want to make two movies. I want to direct and I want to make two of them and that will be the second one because I had always noticed that as a French distributor one told, once told me, he says, most directors make two movies but their first one, their first and their last. <laughs> and so I thought, man, if I'm terrible, if I totally blow it, I want a second chance. <laughs> and I took society because I had been working almost a full year of weird kind of nights with Dan O'Bannon. Remember Dan O'Bannon? Mm -hmm. he, um, he did the Return of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote Alien, and he's a very weird character. And we worked on a movie called The Men, which was, well, we worked on a script called The Men, which was about a woman who discovers that all men are aliens. <laughs> and it was a very paranoid thing that I loved. And finally, when I got it financed, Dan was going to direct, and, and he bailed at the last minute. And I was kind of crushed. And when Rick Fry and Woody Keith, now known as Seth Daniel, brought me the script of Society, it had all the paranoia of the men. So I was already in that world. What it didn't have was any weird stuff, any, it, it was a blood cult, which just, I thought, man, if I'm gonna make a movie, I want some, some weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my, and then luckily the movie was being paid for by Japanese and they introduced me to Screaming Mad George. And then I think this is, um, Screaming Mad George is really the best presentation of his imagination, his kind of sculptural work here. If you know his stuff, he's never had a better platform. And that's why I did Society. I love it. <laughs> you, uh, you sort of teed it up for the next question, which uh, I will say, uh, uh, Quite a few of you were very interested in knowing more about the practical effects. Uh, so let's talk about them, because they are fucking crazy. Um, how did you guys come up with some of the things in this movie in terms of the effects? How did you work through it? Like, what was the process like? Any particular stories behind certain shots? Well, I've, I've, I've taken the time to try to trace back um, things I like in movies to movies that I saw. As they say, the language of movies is movies. Nobody does anything in a, in a vacuum. You, everybody is, is drawing off of shots and scenes and performances that you, know, you saw when you were very impressionable. And I always liked, um, I was always, you know, I, as a, I always liked surrealism. I liked that weird dreamlike kind of stuff, and I liked horror. I guess I got bitten by the horror bug very early. Um, and um, I, when I would watch the horror movies, and like when I finally saw the Universal ones, like The Werewolf, for example, I just wanted to see the transformation. I wanted to see when the guy turned into the wolf, the stop, stop motion, the time lapse stuff. I liked the, I liked that kind of monstrous thing. And I think, you know, later on, I think I trace back the idea of the, of the melding, the, the flesh melding, because that's what, when I saw the script and I thought, well, what do I want to see? If I get to get, if I get to make a movie where I get to call the shots, what do I want to see? And I thought, man, I, 
what haven't I seen? This was the early mid-80s. It was the time of what I call the invasion of the rubber guys in Hollywood, <laughs> which is foam latex, methacellulose, these materials that came out of, I guess it all began with Dick Smith, and we had Tom Savini came from, the, from Vietnam and started doing gore, well, not to say that Peck and Paw didn't beat him to it, but you know, that kind of sense of fun with, with horror. And the, you know, it used to be all done with like mortician's wax and these very clumsy types of, and you look at the 80s and stuff, and you go, God, the monsters just never live up to the, live up to what they should be. But in the 70s, they started, you know, we started Stan Winston, we started seeing the Rob Bottin, we started seeing the new materials of, um, of effects, which were these plastics. Um, methacellulose is the plastic that I think is in Twinkies. You can eat it. <laughs> All those people in the shunting had methacellulose poured on top of them. You will never eat it. <laughs> <It's easy. laughs> um, but you know how these the, the rubber effects of the 80s, at one point, I remember every Nightmare on Elm Street movie, you were going to, to see what they were going to do this time. And there was competition amongst the different effects guys. And, and this was something really new. And I think for the 80s, this was, it was kind of like the CGI of its time. And the other side of it was the, was the replacement um, mechanical effects. So, and, and that was kind of pioneered. It was actually pioneered by, um, I think by, well, I guess you'd say The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing is maybe the best version of it. Um, I think it's, there was the American Werewolf in, in London, which actually came out after The Howling, which had the same kind of, there was, when they discovered that you could kind of stretch a face out and then cut angles, and start with that stretch and move further and make a complete transformation without having to do time lapse. And if you put enough blinking light smoke and methacellulose dripping down, it looks pretty good, you know? <laughs> and so I like that stuff. And I thought, what do I want to see if I'm going to do this? What can they do at the end that isn't just this blood cult? And um, I thought, well, I'd like to see skin melding together. Let's start from that. And um, I have since then seen that, um, I think the origin of that was the um, Dr. X, a movie. 1932? Yeah, yeah, 1932. yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was with, I think Faye Ray was in it, yes. if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's kind of cool, it's, it's right before the Mystery of the Wax Museum. We actually played Dr. X, was anybody here at Apocalypse two years ago? We played that on 35 millimeter, I'm yeah. surprised. And Dr. X was actually, they had a couple of color scenes in it. And he had this, it's not a very good movie. It's, it's got some good style to it. It's got some good style I agree with that. But what's really great about it is that he has this stuff called, um, I think it's called, what is it called? Synthetic flesh. And so the gimmick is the guy that you think is crippled or something, he's going back into his lab and he has this synthetic flesh that he holds over his face. And I think they kind of make it green and yellow at that time. And that, at that time, I mean, that when I was like in junior high, I think I must have seen it on TV, it was like, wow, you know, that's really disturbing. It kind of gave me a couple of nightmares. And so I think that's where it came from, actually. And I think the whole idea of the shunting, this whole idea of this Bacchanal ending, I really think that came from the, the, the 50s version of the um, Ten Commandments that I saw. <laughs> really, you know, the Ten Commandments was actually a horror movie if you haven't seen it. <laughs> and if you, if you haven't, take a look. It's got water turning into blood, it's got smoke killing little kids, it's got <laughs> sticks turning into like serpents, and there's this big G-rated orgy at the end. And when I was a kid, I was like about eight, 
Wow. <laughs> so I think I've always had this idea that a movie should end in an orgy. <laughs> Especially a movie. And of course, taking that flesh melding thing um, to Screaming Mad George when I first interviewed, when I, they sent him to meet me, and we went to his place, and he's, He's, an art, he's basically more of an arty type guy. He's Japanese, and he was in a band called The Mad, one of these kind of art core new wave bands in the early 80s. And he was a big fan of Screaming Jay Hawkins. Hawkins so he called himself Screaming Mad George. And that was The Mad was his band, the Screaming Jay Hawkins, and his name's Joji Tani. So that's where his name came from. And he's a serious um, artist and a very a surreal, a surrealistic artist. So going to his place, the first thing we did is watch Andalusian Dog. And then we looked at Dolly books. And then we looked at his, he does all these um, kind of, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of artworks that are optical illusions. And, you know, in surrealism, you just kind of, it's more about kind of finding you know, it's kind of chain of consciousness type of images that you hope finally have some meaning. Um, that, that, you know, the early lyrics of Bob Dylan are that way. It's just this, you, it just takes all these words and strings them together and eventually you kind of start finding some meaning in it. Dali kind of does that. The surrealist did that. It's kind of trying to tap into something. And, uh, and generally, what I've usually done is if somebody has a great idea or a great image, I go, okay, well, let's take that and let's see if we can back engineer it into our story. And a lot of that working with George, we looked at Dali paintings and we said, okay, let's take, um, we took the, that one painting, I think it's called The Great Master Hater, and that became the Shunti. And if you look at it with the oh, leg yeah. and all that, it's basically a, it's a version of that. And so a lot of what we did was just think up stuff to do. Like if you take the hand, you know, the, the shrink when it's a hand and his head's a hand, and you kind of go, well, what sense does that make? Well, if you started with logic, you'd never get there. <laughs> and ultimately, we never did. It doesn't make any sense. But you know what? It kind of looks cool. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It makes you kind of go, wow, what can happen here, you know? And I think that that is part of the fun of, a, of something that's horrific but surrealistic, something that's surprising. I don't think logic is the end all. I don't think that, but I think you've got to be careful. You've got to have enough to. You know, you gotta, it's gotta be logical enough that you can write it. And of course, I think society does. It's not, the story is, is pretty simple. So that's where a lot of these ideas came from. And I think it was talking with the writers, especially Woody. Yeah, I think he came up with the idea, the term, the shunt, you know, which I think is good. Okay, I was just about to ask, that was really <laughs> expressing. Where does the term the shunt or shunt yeah, Just dealing with the guy who, I mean, Woody Keith, well, he's, he's, he's changed his name to Zeph Daniel now. He lives out in, in New Mexico. And unfortunately, Rick Fry has passed away. But these guys, uh, we just we stay up real late at night and um, look at the script and think up cool stuff, you know? And Woody grew up in Beverly Hills, so all this stuff is, he's, a lot of this, you know, I like to say it's kind of like an unofficial biography of his, and he kind of says, no, it's not, you know? But the characters are definitely, and the situations are, he grew up in that world of um, the very, very wealthy Beverly Hills. Rick was just the opposite. He was, he lived with his in-laws, <laughs> you know? But, um, so there's a certain amount of this idea that Maybe, I think every kid feels like their parents are, I must have been adopted. Um, as you get older, you kind of think, God, my parents are, God, they're disgusting, 
you know? <laughs> so I think he just took it to an extreme degree. Okay, um, there's some good audience questions here. That this one just kind of cracks me up. So I gotta ask him, I'm sorry. Um, sorry to you, but I have to ask because Patrick, is, you, you've asked a good one. How do you feel the movie holds up? No, I'm sorry, that's not the one. Um, there it is. Jesse, thank you, Jesse. Have you ever been ostracized because of this movie? Because I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember once I lost a girlfriend when I took her to Frank, uh, Andy Warhol's Frankenstein in 3D. <laughs> and after the movie, I could tell she was looking like, you like that? <laughs> so I can imagine that might, might have happened to one or two people. Um, I don't think, I, I haven't been off, I don't know, maybe I have. I don't know. <laughs> no, I know, I know that when it, when it first came out, like I said, in, in the UK, it was kind of like a big deal, kind of. Yep. And um, like Sight and Sound magazine had me write an article for them and, you know, but back then, you didn't, you didn't know. There was no internet, there wasn't any really reporting or anything. Or, you know, they, how do you know if any, they, they say, oh yeah, we're doing this. Oh really? Here it's doing shit, you know? Um, I know, we love it. <laughs> no, but even out. my friends would, would be kind of like, yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said earlier, it was really a wonderful surprise when in like around, at the, like about 10 years ago, all of a sudden people wanted to all of a sudden they wanted to show it. I went, what? <laughs> really? And I thought, well, maybe because of the 80s stuff, you know? It's like everybody likes the 80s. And it kind of reminds me of when I watched the, I, I have a friend who, um, a Japanese friend who produced all the uh, J-War. He created, you know, all those, you know, the ring and the grudge and the dark waters and all that. And I would watch some of those movies with um, my friends, and you usually had a girl with hair down in front of her face in the hallway. And um, you would see what's going, you know, you'd see what the actors or the characters are doing, and you'd go, well, that's stupid. Why is she doing that? And they'd say, oh, that's the culture. It's Japanese, you know? I go, no, it looks really stupid, though. And I think right now I get the benefit of people looking at this and going, that's, I don't know about that. They said, oh, it's the 80s. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so I'm very grateful that there is an interest in you. So, okay, that, that perfectly leads me into Patrick's question, which, you know, how do you feel the movie holds up today? I mean, would it be more or less relevant today if it was made? Um, I think, it, I think that, um, Today, I think back then, there was sort of, I thought it was fun to play with the, with the class thing. I mean, the class thing was a part of it um, already. It's not like I added that to it. We just tried to bring it out a little, a, a little more and, and make it more of the explanation. Um, I think today there's a little more skepticism and I think one of the reasons it worked in the UK, besides that they do tend to have a kind of a much more vulgar idea of comedy there than we do, but also I think they really, they never questioned the idea of class. And in, especially in the late 80s, the, the end of the Reagan era here, the greed is good and all that. There, you know, you kind of think that, um, you know, I think, in our country, uh, people really just believe that if you work hard, you're going to get ahead. I don't know. You believe what you want. You know, <laughs> it's. Um, I mean, that is the prevailing myth, and maybe it's there's some cracks in it, so it makes this a little more fun. It makes you kind of go, yeah, we're not aliens. We're not another species. Hey, we're another class. You know, that's much higher up on the food chain. So if somebody like a uh, like a very well-known horror filmmaker producer today came to you and said, I want to make remake society, right? I want to make 2020 society. Uh, one, would you be open for that? And two, what would you say to them? 
hey, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm open for business. You know? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right, uh, a couple of non society questions to wrap it up. Um, one is uh, Do you think you'll ever return to Lovecraftian horror? Keep trying. And two, just following up in that line, what are you up to these days? What are you working on? Well, the, uh, we hopefully we're going to do the last Jeffrey Combs reanimator in, in January. Oh, Places no reanimator has ever gone. Before. There are still places to go. Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm with you. I'll watch that. And I'm Play actually here. working on a society series, believe it or not, in the UK. <laughs> All so right. So you, you do okay. have to update it. I'm open for business. <laughs> well, considering the, the internet and how international everything is, we'll probably find out or be able to see that society series. Um, but either well, it way, would definitely be. With a big company. Yeah. 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 Either way, you know what? It's been 90 years of Music Box. It took this too long to get to society. So I just need to thank you for bringing this to us, bringing it to this audience, and being part of this celebration of ours. And let me just thank you. Thanks a lot.